Hello. Hello again. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'm Bob Continetti, Senior Associate Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs, and I'll be your moderator for this faculty and research town hall. The fall quarter is now well underway, and once again, we have brought together a group of panelists to provide updates on the continuing evolution of our operations during the COVID-19 pandemic and to answer your questions. Some questions were submitted during registration, and please today feel free to use the Q&A window to submit additional questions for our panelists. Due to our time limitation, we will not be able to get to all of your questions, but we will log the questions as they come in and post answers on the Return to Learn website with the link that is being pasted into the chat. Today's webinar has live closed captioning available in two ways. First, you can click on the closed caption button at the bottom of the screen and select show subtitles, or you can also click on the link that is being pasted into the chat. With no further ado then, I'd like to introduce co-host and Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons for some welcoming remarks today. Thanks very much, Bob. Welcome everybody. Um, thank you for joining us for this webinar town hall. Um, I just wanted to express my gratitude on behalf of the entire senior leadership for everything that you've been doing to keep the university going through yet another quarter that is impacted by COVID. I really appreciate seeing so many of you now here on campus in person, doing research, interacting with students, supporting colleagues. I know it's a long haul. Thank you all for uh, sticking together, sticking with us and supporting one another. I'm going to stop there because I know we have a lot to talk about today. So I'm going to turn things back over to Bob Continetti. Thank you, EVC Simmons. Next, we will hear from our other co-host, Vice Chancellor for Research, Sandra Brown. Well, good afternoon everyone. A uh, pleasure to be with you and I will echo my appreciation uh, that you've just heard from EVC Simmons. Uh, we are really pleased that with all the safety uh, guidelines on campus, we're able to have our research operations back fully on track. Uh, we're going to share several important uh, new uh, requirements uh, that are federal requirements and internal requirements, as well as some resources for students and faculty today. But I do want to uh, just take a moment and uh, mention that this will be my last joint town hall with EVC Simmons uh, before I step down from my vice chancellor for research position at the end of the year. I will hold another research town hall to create an opportunity for everyone to meet the next vice, uh, vice chancellor for research. Uh, before uh, the end of this term. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for uh, their uh, tremendous effort, engagement, and uh, support over the years. Thank you. Back to you, Bob. Thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown, and thank you for your service. Next, I would like to introduce Senate Chair Tara Javidi. Thank you, Bob. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Tara Jubidi. I'm the chair of the UCSD Division of the Academic Council. Uh, I will be extremely brief. My goal is to provide context for policy and guidelines that EVC Simmons in a, uh, in a little bit will describe and the role that the Academic Senate has played uh, to get to, uh, to, the, to that framework. Um, first of all, I want to sincerely thank the following five committees of the Academic Senate, the Educational Policy Committee, the Undergraduate and Graduate Councils, the Committee on Faculty Welfare, and the Committee on Diversity and Equity. I believe um, that all of my colleagues here will sympathize with the super tight deadline and timing that quarter system puts on us in general, especially when it comes to scheduling for winter and spring in the classes. So while the official academic senate business normally does not start until mid-October, these committees started working on the issue of instructional modality as early as uh, September 1st, and I want to really thank them for that. And the second uh, thing is I would like to summarize the academic senate's decision, and most importantly, our philosophy, um, uh, because I know that the, the policy details that EBC Simmons will describe uh, will, be, uh, will be further detailed than um, that I thought it would be useful to 
reiterate the policy uh, philosophy from the Senate's perspective. Um, Early October, Educational Policy Committee determined that continuing to allow any course to be offered remotely without an, a clear R designation does not reflect the current state of the pandemic, nor does it acknowledge the faculty's uh, you know, overall commitment to return to primary in-person high quality instruction that UCSD is known for. However, EPC also recognized that there is a continued need on behalf of uh, some faculty to offer some non-R designated courses remotely for the remainder of the academic year. Therefore, the committee approved a limited term exception to the policy on distance education courses. They also recognized that the decision about course modality during the COVID period and in general pandemics are not exclusively issues about pedagogy or academic quality. There are aspects related to faculty welfare and, uh, and equity and diversity that fall outside the bounds of EPC purview and must be considered by both the Academic Senate as well as the administration. So the committee in consultation with Committee on Faculty Welfare and Committee on Diversity and Equity worked uh, closely with EVC's office as well as the undergraduate and graduate councils at the Academic Senate to develop again these uh, the guidelines and the framework that EVC will will in a minute um, go through. Um, my goal, as I said here, is to emphasize though that while the details and the timelines might seem complex, the aim should be understood to be simple. And basically, the aim of the Academic Senate remains to support the mission of the university in providing the highest quality education while acknowledging the diversity of experiences faculty have had and supporting, most importantly, those faculty with continued critical health and family care concerns. So um, at the end, I would like to remind my colleagues that the Academic Senate is uh, a great place for you to get engaged and participate in shared governance. And in particular, our website is a place that you can learn about the modality change, but also other Senate initiatives. Um, and with that, back to you, uh, Senior ABC President. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Javidi. And now I'd like to uh, introduce our first presenter today, Dr. Chip Schooley, Professor of Medicine, and he'll talk to us about the state of the pandemic. Chip? Thanks, thanks very much, Bob. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we have another good report today. Things are continuing to go very well on campus, uh, as uh, I'll discuss. In the U.S., um, we've had the uh, misfortune of um, continuing to see our deaths accumulate since our last meeting. We were close to three quarters of a million deaths although the number is beginning to come down. Um, in uh, California, next slide, uh, we're seeing that the peak that we had at the end of August is continuing to quiet, and that the epidemic in the U.S. has shifted to the northern tier uh, along the uh, Canadian border um, and in Alaska. Uh, there has been concern about this, uh, raised about what will happen when people go back indoors, and questions have been raised about whether this reflects colder weather. I think in this particular case, it's not just colder weather, it's also these are very unvaccinated states. And I think that as we head into winter with the very high vaccination rate in California, we were not gonna see this kind of a sharp rise that they're seeing in these areas. Next slide. Uh, in San Diego County, uh, things are continuing to perk along at three to 400 cases a day. The hospitalization rate is reasonably stable uh, in San Diego County uh, in the upper right-hand panel. And if you look in the lower right-hand panel, you can see that at UC San Diego Health, uh, we are uh, still running a census in the low 20s uh, with most people who are in the hospital being non-vaccinated. We have a few vaccinated people in the hospital, uh, most with underlying conditions. And the vaccines have kept people, for the most part, out of the ICU. You can see that none of the five people in the ICU have been vaccinated. So the vaccines are continuing to do a good job keeping the case rates down and particularly keeping people out of the ICU. Next slide. Uh, the epidemiology uh, in, uh, on our campus is looking uh, quite good. If you uh, look um, on the um, left-hand panel, you can see that the uh, case rate among our students and our employees uh, are um, eight to tenfold lower uh, than in the county as a whole. Uh, you can also see that uh, uh, when you um, Look at the uh, trends on the right panel. Uh, again, things are moving in the right direction with um, the uh, 
occasional cases often on campus, but uh, campus employees doing extremely well. Next slide. This shows you one of the daily, um, next slide, one of the daily um, uh, dashboards we look at every day. And this is kind of very much what we've been seeing the last uh, uh, three weeks or so with a case or two often on campus, uh, very few employees, and really a very good follow-up on the right and green with contact tracing by Dr. Anderson and her team. Next slide. Most of this is due to the fact that our campus has done a great job in getting vaccinated. I want to congratulate uh, the um, employees, the staff and faculty for getting us to 93% of people, um, at least with one vaccination among our campus employees. Health sciences employees are at 96% uh, vaccinated and our students are at about the same rate. So this is a tremendous accomplishment and I think is one of the reasons we're doing so well uh, here uh, at UC San Diego. Uh, on the county uh, scene, uh, San Diego remains one of the most vaccinated counties in the country. And because our campus is embedded in the county, our case rate is very positively affected by having this quiet rate around us. Next slide. Uh, as we speak, uh, the uh, CDC's uh, American Council on Immunization Practices, uh, Committee on Immunization Practices, ACIP, is meeting uh, to discuss the recommendations about Pfizer boosters for children between five and 11. Uh, the uh, discussion, the vote's actually being held uh, simultaneously with this call, but we expect that to be approved today. When that's approved, you'll be able, as you'll see, um, people at any age above the age of five will have access to the Pfizer uh, vaccine. Uh, and people uh, who are over 65, who are immunocompromised or who are in high risk um, occupations. And by that, uh, we mean people who are going to be exposed to people who may not be easily vaccinated, education, uh, or who have significant implications if they get infected, healthcare uh, boosters are recommended so that uh, with the way um, the California Department of Public Health is interpreting this, people at UC San Diego are eligible for vaccination with the Pfizer vaccine. Boosters for the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine uh, are available in the same populations uh, and recommended six months uh, for those who uh, go for boosting after the initial uh, uh, round of two vaccines has been obtained, except for those who are immunocompromised who should get their booster shot um, basically now if they've only had uh, two prior uh, immunizations. And everybody who got the J&J &J vaccine should be boosted. Um, uh, the J&J &J vaccine has been available only to adults and its uh, longevity is not uh, as good as the uh, mRNA vaccines. For those of you who are vaccinated more than two months ago with the J&J &J vaccine, we would recommend uh, being boosted. You can be boosted with the J&J &J vaccine, but I personally think it's um, preferable to get boosted with the Pfizer and Moderna vaccine. You'll get a better uh, result in terms of immunogenicity. And lastly, uh, there's been a lot of discussion, uh, next slide, about the um, uh, what to do with, um, uh, how to deal with people who've been previously vaccinated. This is a CDC uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report that came out last Friday that refutes one of the, um, um, one of the um, uh, urban myths that people who have natural immunity have better um, protection from disease than people who have vaccination. Uh, in this relatively large study of the CDC, people who uh, were vaccinated with one of the mRNA vaccines had about five-fold better protection over a six-month period than those people who had natural infection. Um, people who have natural infection should still be vaccinated because it will reduce your risk of becoming infected by another 50%. Uh, so uh, please, if you've been infected and are relying on natural immunity, uh, please also uh, get um, vaccinated. And then to close, as I was speaking, the CDC, the uh, ACIP um, notice flashed across my screen and the vaccine for five to 11 year olds has been approved by the CDC and will be available next week. Uh, I'll turn this back over to Dr. Cottonetti. Thank you, Dr. Schooley. And now, now we'll hear an update on the COVID-19 vaccine compliance and safety requirements and the flu vaccine mandate from Dr. Angela Shosha, Interim Executive Director of Student Health and Wellbeing and Chair of the Vaccination Mandate Workgroup. 
Uh, thank you. And that's great news, Chip, to hear that the pediatric population is going to be able to be vaccinated. So we have some updates of what's been going on on campus. Because of the really low viral activity and the, what's going on in our community around us, we've been able to add some more freedom to campus operations. One of the first things is a more liberal approach to indoor spaces that uh, in the indoor spaces, I'm sorry, I shouldn't say regardless of vaccination there, but let me clarify that. I forgot to delete it. Vaccinated individuals, specifically vaccinated, now may remove their mask briefly to eat and drink. This is, includes in cubicles, not just in enclosed offices. If though you have an enclosed office, regardless of vaccination, you can also remove your mask for eating or drinking. So the big change is allowing vaccinated individuals who are in some of these more open office spaces to briefly lift their masks for eating or drinking. In the outdoor space, we are still encouraging masking in crowded situations. And if you are a vaccinated employee or student who's been exposed, we ask that you mask in the outdoor spaces to minimize any risk of transmission to others. But you're allowed to actually be on campus now if you've been exposed and you're vaccinated. Our students who are living on campus are now in phase two, which allows them to take off their masks in the common areas. We went into this a couple of weeks ago and it seems to have had no negative effects. We are asking our unvaccinated students who leave campus though, and are engaged in unmasked activities, let's say they're visiting family, actually return in mask for seven days, monitor their symptoms, test upon return and on day five. So these are the precautions we have in place regarding masking. Next slide. Testing. So we've made some progress here as well. For everybody, regardless of vaccination status, we want you to test if you have symptoms, if you have a wastewater signal in a building that you've been working in or living in, please test regardless of vaccination status. Similarly, if you've been exposed, we we'll want you to test upon notification and day five. Surveillance testing though has been changed. No longer do the vaccinated individuals need to do the weekly surveillance testing. We are requiring unvaccinated individuals to test twice a week, no less than three and no more than five days apart. This will continue in through the fall quarter and in all likelihood in the winter quarter. Next slide. Testing is readily available. You can do self-administered tests at the Price Center or by, uh, you can also have an individual do your test for you if you're not comfortable doing that. The vending machines, though, are readily accessible. We have 20 sites available. Employees, as long as they've had one test at the Price Center or Health System, can use the vending machines as well as students. You need your campus ID to release the kit. It will have a dollar on, but that comes off immediately, so there is no cost. The kit will have instructions, swab, and a testing vial. What's really important is that you have downloaded the UCSD app on your phone and that you capture the barcode on the vial. This is how your sample is identified. If you don't successfully capture that barcode, we will not know who the sample belongs to. Once you've obtained your sample, you drop the sample in the kit for the samples and return the clamshell because we are recycling those, the clamshell that the kit comes in. So those are pretty valuable and we want to recycle those. Your results will be back within 24 hours right into sometimes even same day, it'll go into your My UCSD chart or My Student chart. So please take advantage of the vending machines. Uh, during the breaks, the vending machines will be have a one day pickup during fall break and throughout the uh, campus uh, break during winter, we'll continue to have vending machine being open for everybody with pickups on a regular basis. Next slide. Exposure, here's a big change here from a while ago. So in the unvaccinated community, if you are exposed, you still need to remain off campus. Okay, residential students are being moved to quarantine housing. You need to test upon notification day five. You need to monitor your symptoms, do the daily screener. You can return to campus at after day seven monitoring day five negative test on day eight, except for employment functions. As an employee, Cal OSHA only lets you return as an unvaccinated individual after 10 days post-exposure, which means you can return on day 11. The big change is for the vaccinated individuals. You are now allowed to continue to work to be on campus. We've added some extra safety recommendations though in that we want you to mask in the outdoor spaces, that you eat alone, 
If you are a student who has a roommate and sharing a double, we will move you just to protect that other individual. But you can still come to class, you can still participate in research, you can still move around. Again, you do the testing upon notification of exposure in day five, and you continue to monitor symptoms. Next slide. Okay, daily screener. We've made some nice progress here. We revised it and simplified it. We've integrated information regarding your symptoms and exposure, which we always had, but now we've added your vaccination status and your compliance with testing so that we will result in one of three options. Green, you're good to go. No new symptoms, no exposure. You're up to date with either testing or any requirements there. Everything's fine. You may get a red sign. The red could be you have new symptoms or you're unvaccinated and you've been exposed or you've not been compliant with your testing and you're an unvaccinated individual. That will result in a red thumb. You'll get a yellow thumb if you're a vaccinated individual and you have no symptoms and uh, you're doing well, you can come onto campus with those extra precautions of masking in the outdoor spaces and also eating alone. So you'll be seeing these thumbs uh, regularly, they're really working well. Students, just a reminder, who are student employees should go in through the student pathway because their health information is under as a student, not as an employee. So managers, it'll all be integrated. If you have student employees, you'll be able to see their status, but uh, we want the students to go in as students, not as employees. Next slide. Flu vaccine. So we do have a mandate for the flu vaccine. It is November 19th. For health employees, it's even a little bit sooner. We are offering flu shots and we wanna make sure that it's ready available. Please know that you can also get it through pharmacies, through primary care providers, there's ready access. The mandate is managed a little differently for health employees and students. Um, you actually will put your vaccination in self-entry into my student chart or my UCSD chart, unless we gave it to you. If we gave it to you at the health system or the price center, it's already in your record. There's nothing you need to do. To decline the vaccine, health employees fill out a Qualtrics form. The link is right here. Students can let us know through my student chart. For campus employees, we're not using Qualtrics. Instead, you're using your single sign-on and you attest to being vaccinated or to decline. One of the important parts here for campus employees, even if we gave you the vaccine, at the health system or the price center, um, and it's in your health record in my UCSD chart, we still want you to go on to single sign-on. That is the process for campus employees. Next slide. So in case you want to get vaccinated, you can do it again through your primary care provider, a local pharmacy, as well as health system and the price center. It's appointment only. Just follow the uh, link here, go to flu.ucsd.edu, plenty availability. If you want a flu vaccine, it's there for you. And to Chip mentioned the boosters, uh, boosters for uh, educational employees, as we've just got word that we're gonna be able to give this to our students as well. We'll be offering booster shots at the Price Center in mid-November. So keep your eye open for those uh, booster appointments as well. Next slide, I think we're gonna hand it back. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sosha. Uh, sorry, there's a little video issue there, but uh, now I'm gonna turn it back to uh, Executive Vice Chancellor Elizabeth Simmons to talk about winter instruction. Thanks very much, Bob. And um, Senate Chair Javidi gave a wonderful introduction to the um, underlying philosophy of what the um, uh, Senate and administration have been um, trying to accomplish and how the Senate came up with its policy approach. So um, we had a process for fall quarter and Senate and administration agreed that for winter, quor winter quarter, we, we wanted to make the process uh, improved in various ways, um, not just for winter, but for spring and, 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 uh, and the future. And um, the four things that we wanted to focus on were building in-person presence, which really supports student learning in the classroom and outside the classroom, to be sensitive and compassionate to the situations that our instructors, uh, including faculty in all uh, series, uh, uh, graduate assistants, other instructional assistants may find themselves in, 
so that uh, people know that the university cares about their well being. Reduce staff workload where possible, avoid excessive, uh, excessive bureaucracy, and then um, make the process more student centered so that everything would be all set up before the students registered for their courses and there wouldn't be last minute surprises. Now, if we go to the next slide, um, uh, you will have seen uh, what happened. This is uh, exactly what Senate Chair uh, Javidi mentioned. And um, so we disseminated a notice to the campus letting people know what Senate had decided and how we were going to implement it. And if we go to the next slide, I wanted to um, give you uh, a bit of update on what happened. We created a web form for people to submit requests for course modality change. So there was one, uh, one way to submit all of the necessary information all at once. We had just under um, 200 requ requests come in um, by the deadline, and they've been reviewed jointly by um, uh, ADC, Carlos Jensen, and, the, uh, and either the um, uh, undergraduate council or graduate council, depending on uh, what kind of course it was. And they've really tried to process those very quickly. Um, and that has given some shared responsibility, shared oversight, and I think a shared understanding between Senate and administration of what our instructors have been facing and encountering and um, how to best support them. We did build in a, uh, an opportunity for an appeal of the first decision um, uh, since um, that's something that gives people confidence in the process that, that they will really be heard and, and understood before a completely final decision is taken. And again, um, uh, everything's gonna be settled before the course schedule is published tomorrow and then students will begin, uh, begin enrolling uh, next week. And I think that's, uh, oh no, one more slide, just to mention that um, we'll have the same process for spring, but we'll have more time for the implementation so things don't feel so rushed and the process should be more familiar. So um, thanks everybody for um, cooperating with the new process and helping us do our best to support uh, people who are, are having uh, some particularly challenging situations. Thanks, Bob, back to you. Thank you, EVC Simmons, for that important information. Next, we will hear from Vice Chancellor for, Chancellor for Research, Resource Management and Planning, Gary Matthews, about new campus mobility initiatives. Gary? Thank you, Dr. Continenti. Thank you all for being here. I see over 300 of us, and it's, it's rewarding to have you participate. We thought today we'd give you a general overview of some of the mobility initiatives that have occurred and are underway. Um, as you all know, campus-wide safety and security are major elements of our focus for the next several years. Um, and we've developed a, a helmet program that has already distributed 500 free helmets. We have another thousand on order and it's available to students, faculty and staff across the campus. And we really believe that the increased opportunities for micromobility also require us to, to be safe in terms of using them. We have a new partnership with Ford Mobility to provide not only integrated transit and micromobility solutions, but also uh, a better understanding of the number of trips and, and the modality used. To date, we have over 85,000 shared micromobility trips, which uh, adds up to about 75,000 miles traveled thus far. We've also been able to identify geofencing to manage speeds, parking and unauthorized vendors for electrified uh, scooters and bicycles. Next slide, please. Uh, we have certainly had a transformation of the campus related to construction. We've got the Gilman Bridge, the Mesa Pedestrian Bridge that provides great access for our graduate students and students living in the Mesa complexes to uh, access the core campus. Um, and the Voight overcrossing is in process of being improved and should continue through until about the end of January. So we'll see more designated bicycle lanes and most importantly, as the uh, light rail ends its construction phase, uh, we'll see a, a return to some sense of normalcy along the roadways and bike paths. Next slide, please. So transit 
we've been working closely with MTS and they have a new program. It's called Fast Pass. And what they're attempting to do is give people free access to uh, light rail if they register by November 14th and they'll have an activated pass throughout the month of December. So it gives people an opportunity to, to actually ride the new San Diego light rail blue line starting November 21st. Uh, there will be some major transit changes going forward. Uh, let's go to the video. So the blue line starts service every 15 minutes at the end of November, and uh, we're really proud of that service. A little overview of what it's gonna look like. Probably one of the best rides in town that you'll have an opportunity to see from the operator's cabin. Now this is a ride that is normally about 15 to 20 minutes of headway, and you're gonna take it in less than two or roughly two minutes. So many of you may have seen the vehicles on the tracks. Uh, they've been testing for well over a month now, and they've had a number of uh, special rides. And, and this uh, video is certainly special for me because I've been on this journey for well over a decade. And to see it come to fruition will make a major difference in how people come and go to the campus for special programs. And, and I urge you to give your colleagues, friends, and teammates uh, uh, an opportunity to participate in the free pass program that MTS is starting within the month. And I've had some questions because this is the second time I've shown this. Uh, no, it's not gonna run that fast, but a 15 minute headway uh, is great considering that Sometimes you'll sit in traffic near Balboa for 10, 15 minutes at certain times of the day. We'll have two stations on the campus, the central station, and we will have one for the La Jolla Medical Station. And actually there'll be a third, which is part of the VA hospital. So there'll really be three stations serving the campus. It'll give us great opportunity for access to the campus for programs, for education. And we're optimistic that we'll even have folks find some affordable housing uh, along the route. We're talking now to folks that may be developing some housing in the next several years. So great progress. There's many changes on the campus and this is certainly one that has taken well over a decade, but we're happy to see it arrive. So thank you. and. That's the end of our, our ride today. Thank you. Thank you for that exciting uh, news, uh, Vice Chancellor Matthews. We have indeed been waiting a long time for the, for the trolley to come. Next, uh, I'd like to introduce Dean of the Graduate Division, James Anthony, who will give us a few announcements from the Graduate Division. Dean Anthony. Thank you, Bob, and good afternoon, everybody. Just some quick announcements. As you may have heard, uh, there's been an organizational change on campus. So postdoctoral scholar affairs has officially moved to the graduate division. And it's really an effort to try and align our training and professional development functions across our two uh, very important populations, of postdoctoral scholars and graduate and professional students. Uh, all of the functions remain the same. The staff is the same. I want to shout out to uh, Jen Bork, uh, who you all know very well, and her incredibly capable staff uh, for being so fantastic in everything that they've done and will continue to do. Um, and thank, of course, uh, Vice Chancellor of Research Sandra Brown for her incredible leadership over the years of, of this unit. Uh, we're very excited uh, to look for synergies uh, with postdoctoral scholar affairs. The second thing we want to tell you is uh, that we have now are moving more uh, robustly towards the direction of centralized support for non-sponsored projects, particularly around training grants. So a new website has been launched. Uh, it is traininggrants.ucsd.edu. I believe it'll go in the chat here in a moment. And this website's really great. It's gonna continue evolving. By the way, if you see your project not uh, listed on there and would love to get your project highlighted, let us know, uh, send an email just to my office and uh, I'll direct it to the right place. Um, but right now what you will do is you will go to this website uh, because it'll help you to request an institutional letter of support for NIHT 32 grants. 
Uh, I believe a deadline in January 2022. That's the next deadline coming up. Uh, and there's uh, another one coming up in May of 2022. So go to this website. This is a new process. If you're planning to submit for either of those deadlines, uh, visit the website as soon as possible to complete an institutional letter of support request form. Uh, and we'll help you get everything started. This website will also tell you how to request matching uh, student fellowship support for your, uh, for your proposals. And uh, finally, the, uh, we'll tell you about any upcoming training grant uh, staff workshops or support workshops. Uh, I believe the next one is on December 1st, uh, right at noon, from noon to 1.30. Okay, so we're super excited about this. And Bob, I'm going to throw it back to you. All right. Thank you, Dean Anthony. Now I would like to turn it over to our next presenter and co-host of today's town hall, Vice Chancellor for Research, Sandra Brown, to share research updates from uh, Research Affairs. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Bob. And uh, congratulations uh, to uh, VC Matthews. What an accomplishment. It's going to be fun for everyone to have the trolley in place. Uh, and I'm so pleased uh, to uh, see the continuity of services with postdocs. But remember, there's an, uh, another uh, type of researcher here on campus. They're research scholars and visiting scholars. And uh, we will continue in our office the resources for all of those scholars, as well as academic personnel support for research scientists and project scientists that are in the organized research units and, and centers that are run through the Office of Research Affairs. Also, we'll continue the administrative management for research scientist cap uh, through our office. Wanted to mention to people that we are further automating PI exceptions uh, uh, when needed for contracts and grants, and there'll be an announcement coming out shortly about that. A larger portion will be automated, so that should reduce workload for people. Uh, and then uh, finally wanted to mention that we have uh, orientation and professional development programming for research and visiting scholars that will be available and Jen Bork is still helping with that. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, so uh, just a reminder to people that uh, research is back up and operating fully. Uh, there are no pandemic related uh, restrictions for visitors who are coming to campus, except all of the standard policies that you and I uh, adhere to when we're on campus, things like face masks, symptom uh, or exposure screens, et cetera. If you're bringing someone uh, from the media to your, uh, your laboratory or your research setting, those extra steps that you had to take during the pandemic have now been eliminated. We're back to the normal process where you would work with your, your department or your divisional communication staff uh, and ensure that they are aware that uh, media visitors will be coming to campus. All visitors, of course, especially those who are from out of the country um, may need uh, to be, uh, have early restricted party screening. Uh, so those who are from out of the country in particular, and there are some other categories as well, that we easily do launch that effort through the website that's posted here through the export control. So uh, what any researcher needs to do is to, regardless of what type of visiting person they have on campus, whether it's a visiting scholar, uh, a visiting graduate student or postdoc, uh, research scientist, et cetera, or volunteer, you want to inform your department. And then your department will notify the appropriate office as is listed on the table here. So number one thing, visitors uh, adhere to uh, the same requirements that you and I have on campus. Let your department know if you're bringing someone in uh, in to visit other than just for a single day, and uh, they will notify the appropriate uh, department. Next slide, please. Um, there are some very important uh, new federal requirements uh, that uh, can be met almost only by adhering to the policy that we have of 14.5 and 2. So I just wanted to take a moment to review that. 
if you're applying for, for a grant, you let your unit know so that they can create the uh, quality record in the business office 14 days before the, the sponsor deadline. You can notify them months in advance if you know you're going to apply, but at least that's the minimum. And that's important because it lets a whole series of automated processes start to unfold. And your sponsored project office will then need to complete uh, um, at least five days before the sponsor deadline, several specific um, tasks. They'll need to be sure that uh, they've completed the guidelines, the sponsor proposal guidelines as needed, the face page for the grant, the budget and um, budget justification pages, at least the, the, the drafts if those are required, and then um, some very specific proposal requirements three of which require both PI sign-off and department chair sign-off or unit head sign-off, or could be the, the designee from the department chair. These include things like cost sharing, uh, matching funds, et cetera. And uh, the uh, other things that need to be in, in that five days in advance are your bio sketch uh, or your CV if you're a, a consultant. Uh, also, it's good if you can get your research plan draft in uh, that five days in, in advance, and it's important for the sub uh, recipient proposal packages to be complete. So uh, now it's just the day before the application, that is two days before the due date, that you have to get the final version of your research plan in. And on the next slide, I'll share with you why, that, why that's so important. Um, uh, we have such a volume of grants going in at uh, major deadline times that in order for us to ensure that every single grant can make it in on time, we, we need to get that 14, five and two deadline uh, completed. Without that, we are starting to have almost every major deadline, a grant that might not make it in on time because it comes too late. Um, it's really important uh, both uh, because it uh, we can ensure the application gets in, but also it makes uh, it's important because there are many new federal requirements in particular, and in some cases state requirements that have to be adhered to, and that's the only way we can ensure that 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 that's done. We have some great departments. You'll see on, on the left side here, Ophthalmology, uh, Morris Cancer Center, COGSI are doing very well with regard to these deadlines, but there are other departments that are doing not so well. And overall, we're at about 40% compliance with that four, those 14, five and two deadlines. Um, in 2022, the applications will in fact be turned back if they aren't submitted in a timely fashion. Uh, be, because to, uh, to not have an opportunity to review the, the uh, uh, campus's risk for grants um, uh, jeopardizes uh, the, the campus as a whole. We have a faculty review committee that will be uh, going over an exception request process for those that can't meet that 14, five and two, and it'll probably come, need to come from a department chair, such a, such a request. So we're working with faculty now to figure out what's the best way to make sure that we can get uh, these um, requirements met. And I, I would say that sometimes people think, oh, that five days in advance for the administrative materials from the department is onerous. But quite frankly, with the new Kuali system, most of those activities are automated and only one out of 10 grants that are being submitted actually require department chair sign off on some critical areas. So with that, I'm, I'm gonna shift now uh, and introduce uh, Assistant uh, Vice Chancellor uh, for Research Compliance and Integrity, uh, Angie McMahill. And Angie's gonna tell us about what are some new requirements that first come from the NIH, but will spread to other federal agencies. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Angie. Great, thank you, VCR Brown. We wanted to ensure that you were aware of the updates for NIH applications and research performance progress reports, so RPPRs, submitted for due dates on or after January 25th, 2022. 
And it's important to note from the NIH's perspective, these updates are clarifications and guidance to existing requirements, and they're being implemented to assist with transparency of reporting. There are some clarifications to the Biosketch and the other support pages. However, the most significant changes include on other support, researchers must include support from foreign and domestic entities that have been made available to them regardless if it's in-kind support or has a monetary value. There now also will be an electronic certification requirement for other support. So the principal investigators and senior key personnel will be required to electronically sign their other support. It's important to note that the individuals are certifying that the information is true, complete, and accurate. Next slide, please. The PI and senior key personnel will also be required to provide copies of contracts, grants, and agreements related to a foreign appointment foreign appointments, employments, and activities that are reported on their other support. If the documentation is in a foreign language, the documentation will have to be translated into English before its submission. So that's a really big change for uh, the universities. And finally, there is an immediate notification requirement for agencies for undisclosed other support. So the agency is requiring that once an institution determines that something was not reported on other support and it should have been, the institution is now being required to immediately notify the agency of the deficiency. And what's important for you to hear about, uh, about this is that the sponsored project offices are working together collaboratively to develop and, and implement a unified process to, to really address these changes. And we really wanna minimize the administrative burden to the research community. Uh, there is a, a virtual training session that's being offered on November the 10th at 11 a.m. where the sponsored project offices will discuss the implementation plans. And if you haven't registered already and you're interested in attending, please email rci at ucsd.edu and we'll email you the registration link. And as VCR Brown mentioned, it's important to keep in mind that this approach that NIH is rolling out will likely be expanded to and adopted by other federal agencies. So with that, I'll turn it back to VCR Brown. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor Mahill. Uh, next, uh, we have a good announcement about a grant writing assistance program that we have and the Senior um, uh, Associate Vice Chancellor for Research, Miroslav Kristic, will share that with us. Miroslav? Thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown. Uh, so the Chancellor has uh, made an investment into grant writing services. And let me uh, start on the left of this slide uh, by explaining what it is. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, research development team at UCSD is small, very, very talented, but, but small. We have two people that many of you know, Sharon Franks and, and Wendy Groves, and there will be another hire. Uh, this is uh, not a size that can support the campus of this size. Um, so an investment is being made into being able to, um, to hire uh, freelance uh, grant writers uh, who, are, who have uh, the disciplinary um, expertise and also the knowledge of the agency. Our, our um, research development staff have great knowledge of the agency, but no, uh, no two people will, will have the, uh, uh, the breadth of disciplinary expertise that the, uh, the campus generates. So this is, this is the rationale for this. The magnitude of the investment is such that uh, we can give three to 10 uh, awards per year of the size between um, 10K and 50K. Uh, you can imagine that if this, this were done on a first come first uh, serve basis, just based on a request, it might be gone within, within two weeks. So there will be some criteria taken into account in the decision, such as the uh, complexity of the proposal, the readiness of the team, the, the feasibility of, of winning, the benefits to uh, campus, the equity and, uh, and diversity of the portfolio, uh, the budget requested relative to the, um, uh, the grant size and so on. Uh, as far as the eligibility is concerned, in the middle of this slide, uh, it's the large center type proposals that are the priority or the major facility or uh, research infrastructure initiatives and, and these other ones uh, listed on the left. Whereas the single investigator grants, regardless of size, uh, SBIRs, SDTRs, and so on, 
uh, cannot be funded. Uh, the process for this uh, is explained on the chart uh, on the right. And uh, this chart is really um, easy to understand if we take the analog of uh, car insurance, uh, how the car insurance kick, kicks in to cover uh, and, uh, the repairs after an accident. So imagine the equivalent of an accident being, uh, being a, res a funding opportunity. What you do, and, and imagine the, uh, the campus research development team being the insurance company. Uh, what you do first is uh, you con uh, contact the uh, research development uh, team. The research development team informs you about the options regarding the so-called vendors. In, in other words, the grant writers, uh, but you as the PI know what uh, who the best match uh, may be and you, uh, 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 contact and interact with the, the vendors. Uh, you receive a quote, you come back to the um, uh, research affairs and we take care of the, the cost. So uh, um, with that, uh, I would like to turn it uh, back over to you by Chancellor Brown. Thank you, Miroslav. It's a wonderful for opportunity for faculty who are working on large projects, either uh, within our campus or across our other UCs or other types of institutions. So a uh, great opportunity, encourage you all to take advantage of that. Next, we're gonna hear uh, uh, two very positive updates from the Associate Vice Chancellor for Innovation and Commercialization, Paul Robin. Paul. Cool, thank you, VCR Brown. So yeah, we, we're delighted to uh, announce the grand opening of the Design and Innovation Building. And uh, if you're watching the video that VC Matthews played, this is the building right there at the uh, General Campus Station. So as you're leaving the station going north, you go right by the building. Um, so it will be officially opening on the 18th. Um, it has a whole bunch of resources uh, that are there to cater to the innovation and entrepreneurial needs of the students, the faculty and the staff, and in, in fact, the entire community at San Diego. Um, so very briefly, it has an entrepreneurship center, which will uh, host the community investors and management and so on. It has the design lab. It has a whole series um, of maker spaces and prototyping and assembly spaces and incubator and accelerator space for students. So we're delighted that it's going to be opening. And um, if we go to the next slide, uh, these are just a, a few of the programs that we will be running um, in the building as, as soon as we get it all activated. Uh, the basement is, is uh, moving over from the basement. It used to be two floors underneath the Mandeville uh, Theater, and now it's going to be on the first floor of this building. Um, we're going to keep the name The Basement because it's good branding. So this is where any student um, from any school department across um, the campus is welcome to come and learn the fundamentals of entrepreneurship, building their own project and their own company as they go. Uh, the Innovation for National Security program, we work together with all of our military partners in the area, so NIWIC, Miramar, Pendleton and so on. They bring to us problem sets that they have and teams of students um, get together and, and uh, solve those problems. And in the process, they learn the culture of the DOD and also learn the fact that there are actually a lot of very exciting career opportunities for them right here in San Diego. Um, and they develop the connections in order to be able to access those opportunities. The Essentials for Oppor uh, Entrepreneurship course is something we've been running for a number of years. This is a six week course delivered by practitioners, CEOs, CFOs, et cetera, from the community. They come in and they tell their stories and teach the fundamentals of entrepreneurship open to anybody. We have uh, staff, students, faculty, and uh, members from the community who basically walk in off the street. Uh, the current um, program is running right now, but there'll be another one running in the, uh, in the winter quarter. And then the innovation sprints where we bring companies, local government, port, uh, airport, et cetera, and they again come in with their um, problems and teams of solutions are invited, our teams of students are invited to develop solutions to those. And again, they develop career opportunities, they learn the culture of these other organizations um, and get to meet other students at the, at the same time. And finally, I'd just like to say, by the way, uh, thanks to ABC Bob Cantonetti, who has been leading a lot of the efforts in getting this uh, building act activated as well. So as you can see, we're all very excited by this building. And uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me. Thank you. Back to you, VC or Brad. Yes, uh, thank you, Paul. It's wonderful to have all these special services 
for students back up and rolling. And uh, I believe that's the end of our research component. So back to you, Dr. Continent. Well, well, thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Brown and, and all of the presenters today. And yes, I am especially excited about the opening of the Design and Innovation Building. And it's exciting to hear about some of the programs that are going to be held there. Now it is time to turn the question and answer segment of this town hall. And uh, for that purpose, I invite all of our panelists to turn on their videos. Uh, we've done this uh, many times before. So we know that uh, during registration, you, the attendees, have had an opportunity to submit questions for the panelists to answer. We've selected some of the most popular questions for the panel today that we're going to address. If you have a question now, please use the Q&A window to submit additional questions during the session, and our panelists will do their best to provide answers. Due to time limitations, we may not be able to get to all of your questions. However, we will do our best to post answers in the FAQ at returntolearn.ucsd.edu. So turning to the first question, uh, this is for uh, EVC Simmons and Senate Chair Javidi. Will an instructor still have the discretion to offer some portion of their course remotely in the winter quarter? And this is noting that currently 49% can be virtual for in-person classes. Let me just say, yes, that is the Senate policy on distance education. It still applies. Thank you. Yep, I confirm. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for EVC Simmons and Dr. Sosha. Do you anticipate that the masking requirement for indoor instruction will be lifted for the winter quarter? Um, I do not at this time, but perhaps Dr. Sosha knows something that I don't. No, I think it's realistic to think that we will begin the winter quarter with masking required. If we recall last year that we had a very significant spike of activity after the holiday period. Now we're in better shape than we were last year. We've got vaccination, but we also have Delta and some other things going on. So I believe we'll begin with masking. And then if things are going well, we'll try and lift things. For the remainder of the fall quarter, we will have classroom masking going on as well. Um, we think that's the safest thing to do now, but we'll be trying to liberalize things as much as we safely can. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for Dean Antony. Who is responsible for monitoring the daily symptom checker for graduate students? Thank you, great question. So the daily symptom checker as a rule of thumb is monitored by our colleagues in the health services uh, part of this whole operation. And so if somebody triggers with a thumb that uh, uh, raises concern, they will be uh, um, reached out to, they will be contacted by the health services individuals, uh, our colleagues there. And in general, the Vice Chancellor for Student Affairs Office is going to be monitoring non-compliance issues. Uh, and I do wanna just say a note here, um, we, we have a, a number of uh, students uh, who for a variety of reasons may be non-compliant either with the exemption requests or the vaccination uh, reporting. And so anything you can do as our colleagues to help students uh, remind them of their obligations uh, to be compliant with this mandate is really, really helpful. We certainly wanna avoid uh, having students get any kind of academic hold placed on their records as a result of non-compliance. Hope that answers the question, Bob. Thank you, Dean Anthony. The next question is for Dr. Sosha. Does a student have to provide a note from a medical provider to have their absence from class counted as excused? No, we actually removed that requirement in the early part of the pandemic. We don't want students who are symptomatic moving around campus, picking up medical notes, or instead actually going to classes when they're ill because they have the inconvenience of getting a medical note. So we made a decision early on in the pandemic and the academic Senate had a chance to weigh in that medical notes are no longer required. We're trusting the students to give us an honest answer regarding their symptoms and illness. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. And now we have a question about the end game with respect to the pandemic for Dr. Schooley. At what infection rate, cases per 100,000 people, for example, will we consider the pandemic over? So this virus has entered the population. It's gonna be with us for hundreds of years. Uh, what I do think we're gonna see though is as more uh, immunity in the population is uh, evolves with vaccination and with uh, 
recurrent rounds of infection like the other three coronaviruses that have been circulating in the human population. We'll see periodically the virus uh, come through and, um, and cause illness. Uh, the virus is gonna cause the most morbidity for people um, as other viruses do who are at the eight ends of the age spectrum. In this case, particularly people who are older or people who have underlying conditions uh, that involve organ system damage or immunodeficiency. Um, the pandemic itself, uh, in terms of what we've been seeing with filled ICUs and that sort of thing, I, I think will gradually be less and less of a threat. Although in places where vaccination rates are low and there are parts of the US where that's the case, it will continue to be uh, possible for the virus to come back and cause shortages of hospital beds and so forth, probably for the next year or two. Uh, places like Idaho and um, Washington state most recently saw that. I don't think we're gonna see that happen here in uh, Southern California right now, unless a new variant emerges, but we're gonna to have to keep our eye on that because this virus is still uh, in a fairly metastable relationship with the human population and can evolve over time. So we have much better tools to deal with it. We have to keep our eyes open, but I don't wanna make a prediction about which month and which year we're gonna be able to declare the pandemic over. Well, thank you for that sobering uh, message, uh, but it's a, it's a reality. The next question is for Vice Chancellor Brown. Will we still need to submit new or update our existing research ramp up plans in the future? Just as with uh, many other things, and you can tell from uh, Dr. Schooley's response, we always want to be prepared for any emergent problems. And so uh, your research ramp up plans, uh, it is advised that you keep these updated. And the reason for that is, should there be another circumstance where we would need to cut back on activity in the research setting, we'll have a ready way to do that. Now that said, I just wanna remind everyone that the work location status form is required for everyone uh, on campus for faculty and uh, for, for staff and employees. So uh, that's a very important uh, form because it tells us where people are and when they're there. And it's a way for us to quickly notify you uh, should the virus be detected in your building. Thank, thank you, Vice Chancellor Brown. The next question is for Dr. Sosha. And this is something I think you addressed to some extent in your presentation, but could you please clarify or outline the current testing requirements for unvaccinated employees? Sure, unvaccinated employees, the unique requirement for them is to test twice a week. And that should be no less than three days apart and no more than five days apart. Individuals who are rarely coming to campus should get a test within 48 hours prior to coming onto campus and the day they arrive. But for unvaccinated folks coming regularly to campus, please, it's twice a week testing. That'll be ongoing at least through fall and the early part of winter quarter and possibly all of next year. So, and you can do that testing through the vending machines, or if you're not comfortable with that, you can do that on the Price Center on campus. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. And don't go away, though, because the next question is for you as well. Sure. What, what are the current guidelines regarding food at campus events and meetings? This was just modified recently, which is an, another sign of how well we are doing. So vaccinated individuals are allowed to briefly lift masks for eating and drinking at campus meetings and events. So that is a change. It's a good sign. Yeah. That's great. No, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sosha. And uh, it looks like uh, I think we're going to move to uh, to wrap up early today. Uh, we really uh, addressed uh, the most significant questions that we had received, and uh, we will continue to uh, update uh, the FAQ on the Return to Learn website as well. And we'll post a recording of today's town hall as well. So we're going to give you a, a few minutes of your time back which I'm sure you will appreciate. Uh, but I would like to thank at this point the presenters and, and our guests for sharing their time and information with us today. And I thank you, the faculty and researchers of UC San Diego for attending today, working together as a community during these challenging times. 
we had more than 330 attendees today. And uh, I believe that these town halls have become an important part of how we've stayed united as a community during this challenging period. Again, to help improve them, we encourage you to complete the post-event survey that you'll be sent shortly to help us continue to refine our communications. The next Return to Learn Town Hall for staff will be on December 8th. So please visit the Return to Learn website to register. The link has just been inserted into the chat. So with that, this concludes today's Return to Learn Faculty and Research Town Hall. So I wanna thank you again, ask you to please take care, stay safe, and I look forward to seeing you all on campus again soon. Take care.